This morning, we're in the book of Hebrews. We're taking you to the classroom. Is that all right? <laughs> we're in the book of Hebrews, chapter number four, verses 14 through 16. And this morning, we're going to read it from the New King James Version. Verse 14 says, Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace. There goes those words again. To help us in the time of need. This is the word of the Lord. If you'll join me in prayer, Jesus, we love you and we thank you in this place. We lift up your holy name. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to learn and fellowship in your word. In Jesus' name, Lord, let now the words of my mouth of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, as you always do, grant me clarity of thought and precision of expression, as only you can. Right now, we speak healing, we speak freedom, we speak salvation, we speak deliverance, we speak the things that this church needs, O God. We speak it now in the name of Jesus. God, even right now, I ask that you anoint me, anoint me fresh, O God. But don't let me phone it in, O God, but speak, Lord. Lord, we need a rhema word. We need a right now word in this place in the name of Jesus and we're believing you for it in a faith-filled church said amen and amen you may have your seats in the presence of the Lord we're in there is fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore and so uh, when I originally learned that I was going to be speaking in this great month of February <laughs> I considered many themes and topics and and one of the ones that seemed to resonate with me and where I am now and, with, and moreover where we are as a body of believers was this theme about how the saints had ought to never give up. And I found myself in the book of Hebrews uh, for a long period of time in my study and, and what I landed on was today's topic. And so if you're somebody who likes titles, amen, would you say this with me? Listen, I want you to say it, okay? I need my young people to say it like you from the Bronx, okay? Say, I'm built different. Say it like you from 233rd and White Plains. I'm built different <laughs> for these critical times. And, and we've got a lot of educators in here. Shout out to Tammy and all our educators, to Natalie. So before you correct my grammar, I want to let you know I got this phrase right out of the Urban Dictionary. We're saying that that we exceed expectations, right? We, we defy the norms of achievement, right? And that is what I managed to get somehow. That is what I managed to get out of my study of the book of Hebrews. And so for some brief history on the book of Hebrews, we know that Hebrews is, is one of the epistles. That is, it is one of the letters to the church. Uh, the book of Hebrews, like I said, is an epistle written by an unknown author to the Jewish Christian audience uh, though many of us believe that it was written by Paul because the tone is similar to that of Paul. The purpose of Hebrews is to emphasize the superiority of Christ over the Old Covenant. You see, there is no longer a need for repeated sacrifices because Jesus is the one and only sacrifice. But I wanted to look at Hebrews today because I, I took interest in this idea that Hebrews is not written to a people who are new to this, but rather it is written to a people who are true to this. In fact, many scholars regard Hebrews as one of the most complex letters to read as it requires a great deal of knowledge on uh, Old Testament culture and Old Testament uh, Jewish practices. Hebrews takes great lengths at establishing the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant under which we live today. But in spite of this complexity, what I particularly appreciate about Hebrews is this theme of the saints never giving up, never giving up on our purpose, never giving up on God, how we, how we had ought to persevere. The overall message behind Hebrews could really be summed up in that great verse that we like to read, Hebrews chapter number 11, verses 1 and 2, where it says, let us run with 
perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Some versions say the author and finisher of our faith. But in today's text, we find the writer presenting Christ to us as our high priest. He says, we have this great high priest. Now, the reason this is so important, once again, because of the audience the writer is talking to, right? Because these are Jewish Christian believers, this, this letter is addressing the people who are very familiar with the role of priesthood. A priest in the Hebrew culture and tradition has a unique responsibility related to sacrifices. Now, I want to remind you, I said before, because of Jesus, there is no longer a need for repeated sacrifices. Jesus is the ultimate and one and only sacrifice. In fact, what we believe under the new covenant, just for some station identification real quick, we believe in offering ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, as Paul urges us in Romans 12.1. In other words, under the new covenant, we believe that because Jesus died for us, fulfilling that ultimate sacrifice, we are to live for him. So the writer of this letter has to be specific about how Jesus' sacrifice supersedes the prophet, it supersedes the priesthood, it supersedes Moses, and all of that because of what Jesus did. And so the text says once again in verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. The scripture say we have to hold firmly to what we believe is what it's saying. Why? Because we have access. That's the thing that gets me. Uh, you know, as uh, Sister Ramos was ministering up here, I was just thinking about how we have access to this great high priest, to this mediator. Amen? That's such an amazing thing. So I believe that portion of, of this text today is about the privilege we have as saints. We are a privileged group of people. Hallelujah. Sometimes it don't feel like I'm privileged, but I have to remind myself with the access I have to my Lord and Savior, with the access I have to Jesus, I am a privileged man. Hallelujah. We are privileged men and women. Thank you, Jesus. And so this access to salvation, this access to this great mediator is such a privilege. And the letter goes on in verse 15 to address also the humanity of our faith. I love this part. This part is so key to me. We learn about this in the Gospels. In verse 15 it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus came down and was tempted just like we get tempted. That, that appeals to my humanity. He, I'm glad that God found it important to appeal to our humanity to come down and be tempted like we are so that he can relate. A lot of times as a believer, I feel like who can relate to me? Someone who's trying and trying and struggling to, to do it right. Jesus can relate. He experienced the fullness of this temptation, but also endured it. So with this understanding of what Christ has done, what are we to do? It says in verse 16, let us therefore come how boldly, come boldly where to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So look at somebody and say, grace is the thing I need in my time of need. Mercy is the thing I need in my time of need in order to do God's will. So, so what are you talking about? Brother Slack, as always, I'm so glad that you're asking that question, for I have an answer to that question. <laughs> I wanted to take some time today as an opportunity to direct or even redirect us back to our agenda. We have an agenda. We Disciples of Jesus Christ have an agenda. We call it the kingdom agenda. Now it seems that we are in a day and age where everyone seems to be so bold about their agenda. I think that must mean it's time for the saints of the living God to get bold about our agenda too. Our agenda as the body of Christ is to glorify God. 
Our agenda as the body of Christ is to glorify God, is to advance his kingdom, to bring people to Christ and disciple them in the faith. I'm talking about those old principles that used to make the church the church. We still have an agenda. And this isn't in my notes. Have you? I know a lot of us work and we, we have meetings. And sometimes in those meetings, we, we, we look at our watch and we're in the last five minutes of the meeting. And it seems like we haven't accomplished hardly anything on the agenda. Amen? The, the goal of a meeting. Meeting is usually to accomplish what's on the agenda. And I want to let us know that we can't be so distracted by everything else around us that we forget what our agenda is why we are here on earth. We have a kingdom agenda. And so we got to get back to our agenda. I decided to use the book of Hebrews to help us refocus because every now and then we just may need to be reminded that the God Almighty that we serve is a promise-keeping God. He's a covenant-keeping God. And he's the same yesterday and today and forever. And so back then, he was a promise-keeping God. He was a covenant-keeping God. And guess what? Now he's still a promise-keeping God and a covenant-keeping God. Can someone shout to our promise-keeping God? Hallelujah in this place and so the truth of the matter is we are indeed in critical times you can open your eyes and see that we are in critical times right and critical times calls for devoted disciples of Jesus Christ we are literally witnessing the very idea of holiness be publicly frowned upon right we are witnessing that and that's what the Bible prophesies that we will we will witness frowned upon holiness right and, and of course you know I'm expecting that in the streets right I'm expecting that in the world but I'm talking about sometimes we are witnessing the idea of holiness be frowned upon in church circles can somebody shout critical times when times get like that we have got to as this writer says, hold fast to the confession of our faith. We have reached a point where our faith is the only thing that will get us through. And here's the thing. I know it gets hard, man. I know. Okay? Is anyone here like me, you ever experienced some of the most difficulty and some of the most difficult tests in places that God, God's the one who sent you there? Why is this so hard when I'm being obedient? Right? Even when I think of how I ended up here in New York, I've had a few conversations with the Lord. I'm like, Lord, this is where you sent me. This is, this is something out of the ordinary that you told me to do. And I, I'm still facing tests and trials, even in obedience. I would understand if, you know, I, I, I didn't do what you told me to do. I would understand if, if I was being disobedient and there was a consequence. But sometimes we, as believers, we face trials and tests in our obedience. For example, Abraham, right? We know, we've seen both disobedient Abraham and obedient Abraham. I'm not sure if, if you remember what he had to endure. We, you know, in children's church and VBS, Vacation Bible School in the 90s, we learned that Father Abraham had many sons. <laughs> many sons also had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you, and let's just do what? Praise the Lord. That's the Abraham that we know, but sometimes I remember Remember that and forget about the Abraham that he and his wife had, had faced many trials to, to, to have children, even though he was told that he would be the father of many nations. And, and they had reached, it had been years and years and years, and there was no evidence, no sign of any many nations coming from them. They had even reached their old age, and, and, and then they finally gave birth. Amen? But that's not even the part of the story I'm talking about. This is what gets me, okay? If you go a little further down in Genesis, we find out that Abraham had finally given birth. And they had, they had this son, Isaac, right? But then, okay? Hey, remember, I just want to remind you, it was two times Abraham didn't do what he was supposed to do. And then the third time he did, and then that's when he gave birth. God gave him another assignment. This time he was like, okay, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it because I messed up twice and then you came through for me when I finally was obedient. Abraham was sent to this place called Mount Moriah and some of you know where I'm going with this. Amen. He was sent to this place called Mount Moriah and, and God said, take your son with you and offer him up as a sacrifice. Come on. Come on, y'all. 
right? And Isaac begins to see, uh, we, we, they've reached a destination and, and, you know, even though he doesn't fully know why they're where they are. And in verse 7, he says, uh, Dad, <laughs> he says, Dad, I have, I, I have a question. I'm that, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Isaac. I'm like, Dad, what, what, what are we doing, okay? We've gone all the way to Mount Moriah, like, like you know, we, you told me, he said, here I am, son. I'm here to answer your question. He said, and this, this is the part that gets me, he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? He said, where is the sacrifice? Now, I don't know about you. In fact, I'm, I'm sure this is most of us, okay? I'm not even a parent yet, but I know we got some parents in here who's like, that would be where I failed the test. I'm walking, I'm being obedient, I'm doing what God told me to do, and I'm getting ready to go to the thing, and, and my son says, hey, Dad, where's the, the sacrifice? I'm, okay, that's it. All right, God, <laughs> I need some, some intervening. I don't know about you. That's a big deal. He's getting ready to essentially murder his son and offer him as a sacrifice to God, amen? So I can only imagine how deep down to the depths of his soul he had to reach to accomplish this level of faith, to accomplish this level of obedience. I, I want to point out, though, that, that this is not the place that Abraham was hiding from God like we saw earlier in Genesis with Adam and Eve. This was not a place that Abraham fled to. This place wasn't consequential. Abraham was where? Where was he? He was at Mount Moriah where God sent him. This test occurred after being obedient, after doing what he was told, after he finally accomplished the thing that he was promised, becoming a father, right? So this is where God sent him. He got to the point where his son is like, we got to get the sacrifice. And just in the nick of time, listen to this. Because if you know the full Bible story, and this is why I love Hebrews, I, I, I finally got it. I finally got this. Sometimes, you know, when I, I, I study the Word of God, it takes me a while before I get things. But this, this, this was the time I got it. So listen to this. Just in the nick of time, a lamb appeared out of nowhere to replace Isaac as the sacrifice. I don't think y'all get me right now. Just in the, as Isaac was about to be sacrificed and die, a lamb appeared right on time to replace him as the sacrifice. Okay, okay. I don't know if you understand. Now, of course, we realize now that that was a temporary land, but this was just an ill God was giving us an illustration of what would happen with us. We were headed to death, but just in the nick of time, as the sacrifice was about to take place, a lamb appears. Hallelujah. Somebody shout Jesus in this place. Woo! Just in the nick of time. When we were sinking deep in sin, woo, the precious lamb of God took our place. I got some more notes, so I got to keep going. Woo, I know y'all want to have some church. I want to have some church too, but I got to keep going. Woo, I'm not sure if anyone's ever endured what Abraham was presented. And in fact, I'm sure most people haven't, right? Thank goodness. No one's ever had to sacrifice their child, right? Has anyone ever felt, though, like you've reached that place that if you give any more, you're going to lose it all? I'm sure that's how Abraham felt. He, that's, that's all he had left. That if, that if you give any more, it, it would just end you. I came today to encourage just a few young people who are learning here at the church. Maybe you, you hear the gospel, you hear the word of truth, and, and then you're thrown back into the world. You're thrown back into the world of school, into the world of college, into situations where you're hearing everything that's opposing the truth. And in a world where the social consequences seem to be catastrophic, or when you try to stand up for the truth, in a world where social media would have you be deleted if you stand up for the truth. But I came today to tell somebody that you don't have to lean on your own understanding. I said, you don't got to lean on your own understanding, but I heard somewhere that I can trust in the Lord with all of my heart and not lean on that understanding and acknowledge him in every way and he's going to make my path straight. So what am I saying? I'm saying you got to stand on this word that faith is what we have to be built with in order to be what? Built 
different in these critical times. Remember, y'all, Hebrews is for what we call the seasoned saints, what, the, what we call the saints. Who, who aren't needing to hear the gospel for the first time. They, they know their word. And so that's why I decided to use that because I know we've got a lot of people in here who know the word, who are walking the walk, but maybe just need to be reminded of the agenda. Maybe just need to be reminded about the type of faith that sometimes it costs us. Um, and this isn't in my notes, but it was going to be. And, and Sister Natalie was talking about how Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek. I remember in that scripture talks about how we ought to press on, press on toward what? Toward maturity. Be open with that scripture. Right? Press on toward maturity. We're not baby saints anymore. So we're not going to be given baby tests. Sacrificing your son is not a baby test. All right? That's not, that's not a, the a beginning of my salvation test. That was a real thing. Amen. Even Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, he says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I had to put away my childish things. Saints, after a while, we got to recognize that we are not spiritually children anymore. Church, these are critical times and critical times call for critical measures. Abraham didn't think that he had what it took to do what God told him to do on Mount Moriah, but God knew what he was doing the whole time. Isaac and Abraham were rescued by the lamb and they didn't know that they would have what they needed. They went not even knowing that they would be given exactly what they needed in the nick of time. Abraham thought he was going to have to lose it all, but still somehow he had what he needed. And church, I encourage you that when we have Jesus, no matter how bad it looks, we have what we need. I don't care what else you put down, but don't put down your faith. I don't care what else you put down, don't put down Jesus. We have to hold fast to our confession. Oh, hallelujah in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Just a little bit more. I want to talk to my young people real quick before we have church. I'm an educator and I find it interesting that one of the foremost nursery stories <laughs> that's usually told to children in the very early stages of their childhood development is the story of the three little pigs. How many of the children know the story of the three little pigs? It's all right to raise your hand when I was your age. I thought that story was pretty lit too. Uh, three little pigs, right? <laughs> Amen. And, and because I thought that was so interesting because even at a young age, we were infatuated with this idea of how we can protect ourselves from the adversary, uh, for the young people, protect ourselves from the ops, right? We had to protect ourselves from the ops. That's what they call the opposition, in case you don't know, okay? We were even in that early stage infatuated with this idea that in order to be safe from our ops, we couldn't just build our, our house out of any old thing, amen? Even at an early age, we knew our house our place of refuge, our place of protection had to be built with the right stuff. And come here, Peter, because, because even Jesus said it. He's, in his illustration on, on forming the church, he didn't say, oh, upon any old slab of wood, I built my church. He didn't say, upon just a, a bundle of straws, I built my church. What he said, to, to talk about our faith, he, he said it had to be something solid, right? He said, upon this rock, I build my church. The rock was his faith, just so you know. Somebody shout faith. Our faith is how we get through. Our faith is how we achieve. And Bishop used to say it like this. Hallelujah. She said, we have the capability to do what? To bounce back when we are made of the right stuff. And so what am we talking about? The stuff we got to be made of to bounce back in these no longer baby trials. We got to bounce back with our faith. We got to bounce back with the spirit of God. We got to be built up of the right stuff. We got to build our house of solid rock. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus said it like this. I have told you these things, John 16, 33 so that you may have peace in this world. Woo! In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. Somebody shout, take heart. 
I'm talking about the, the seasoned saints. I'm talking about the people who have pressed on to maturity. I want you to encourage somebody around you to take heart. He said, I've overcome the world. So when you're built up of the right stuff, because he overcame, we have the power to overcome too. Jesus, I'm encouraged all over again by this. I got stuck in Hebrews, Pastor White, and this is what happened to me. I, I, I realized the, the, the going started to get tough. I'm like, man, I, I gave my life back to Christ. I tell this story a lot. This church is a huge part of me, of my rededication. And I mean, I was just walking on sunshine and it sure felt good. I know we don't got the copyright. I gotta be careful to that song, right? I was, I, everything was peaches and cream. And then the tests and the trials started to get more and more difficult. And I was like, wait a minute, but I'm doing what you told me to do, God. I, I'm going to church every week, paying my tithes and offering and I'm ministering, you know, on the job. I'm doing what you told me to do. I, and, you know, I got my scripture and I'm still going through some crazy stuff. How is that possible? It for what ha had to happen for Abraham. He had to press on toward maturity. He said, no, God got me out of something before. I refuse to believe that he won't do it again because I understand who my God is. And I understand that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I'm going to trust God anyhow. I wish I had some saints in here who said, I'm going to stand on his word anyhow. I'm going to trust him anyhow. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. So the thing I came to say to the young people is that through thick and thin, stay with God. Stay with God. Stay with, take my word for it, it's better to stay with God. I know we're in a world right now where it seems like it's getting tough for the believer, especially for the young believer. I know when you look around and it seems to be getting more and more uneasy, I know you look around and it seems like nobody even stands anymore. Who's even standing anymore? Or why am I doing this if nobody else is doing it? Stand. Stand. Hold firm to your confession. Stay with God. When the going gets tough, I dare you to tough it out and see how God will see you through. And this is the thing, I, and the reason I wanted to use Hebrews and Abraham and, and bring back those stories that I know we've been learning about upstairs is because, because it, you know, it's Black History Month. Shout out to Black History Month. Amen. And I want to shout out, one of my favorite Black History Month heroes is Bishop Michelle White. She's the best. That's all right, we can say it. It's Black History Month. I did it. Said it. She was all that. <laughs> Amen. So it's Black History Month, though. And I use Abraham to refocus us and re remind us some things that people, even in the body of Christ, go through is crazy. It's not normal. It's not okay. We go through things even as people of God. You know, the saints of old used to sing a song, we shall overcome someday. And, and, and Brother John, the prophet in the book of Revelation said that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Hallelujah. And so I want us to be reminded of our testimony uh, as, as black people, right? As black saints, right? We've been through some things. Just like Abraham, it wasn't normal. It wasn't just a, a little bit of faith. It required big faith. Right? Can I tell you something? These things that we went through was crazy. Slavery was crazy. Don't let them gaslight you. Slavery is not normal. It's crazy. The idea of slavery was crazy. It was crazy. Right? Segregation was crazy. There are people among us who live through segregation right in this room. It was crazy. Jim Crow was crazy. Some of the things that we as the body of Christ go through at the hands of people who claim to also be in the body of Christ is just crazy. Don't let them gaslight you. Look at someone and say, don't let them gaslight you. That stuff was crazy. That mess was crazy. And still, somehow, somehow justice prevailed. In, the, in Abraham's situation, justice prevailed. Somehow, just even in the situations that we're dealing with today, justice still will prevail and I believe because God did it before and because he is the same yesterday and forever that justice still will prevail that we're still gonna make it what did the saints of old used to say we shall overcome hallelujah we shall overcome someday I don't know when it's gonna happen I don't know how it's gonna happen and so 
justice prevail in every situation that we've gone through and it's gonna always somehow come here Paul he said the he said somehow I know that the suffering of the present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed to the people of God somehow he knew even in the situations he was in he said seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens somebody shout Jesus Jesus the son of God let us hold fast to our confession look at somebody and say I'm holding fast to my confession for we do not have a high priest that don't understand he said we don't got a high priest that can sympathize to our weakness he said at every single point he was tempted yet without sin in other words people of God because of the God we serve because we serve the God we serve we have the wherewithal to make it through and even when we slip up even when we fall all the way down to the ground he said because of the God we serve let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace when i go to that throne no matter how i look i know that when i get there it's gonna be some grace there when i go to the throne no matter how much i messed up there's gonna be mercy so let us boldly go because i know what to expect when i get there hallelujah Woo, jesus boldly to the throne of grace in our time of need because even in these critical times we've got access to that divine grace and mercy now church these are sure enough critical times the saints of the living God will make it because we've got the Spirit of God living on the inside of us and therefore we are what built different hallelujah come on somebody stand up and give God some praise right now in this place for everything that we have everything that we have in Jesus everything that we have under the new covenant hallelujah I'm glad that I don't got to be sacrificed I'm glad the lamb came to save me and if you're someone in the